Mathematics is the foundation of the universe. We see it on Earth, the Moon, all the planets in our solar system. It has been here since the universe began, and will most likely be here after our universe has been extinguished by the great darkness that eventually gets all universes past and present. To some, mathematics has the same euphoric effect a musician or a singer gets from hitting that perfect melody. One such man, who many consider the father of geometry, was Euclid, a Greek mathematician and avid geometer, who laid the foundations of geometry as we know it today. Ormin Korvastindra punched in coordinates on a hollow projected map of a nearby nebula swirl star system. Had he have been from Earth or Earth's solar system, he would have known his starship's ability to lock onto a location is all because of Euclidean geometry. But Ormin was from a very distant star system to ours, and they would have their own name for navigation through a three-dimensional space. I guess what he was, we would call a space viking. Almost eight feet tall, and a solid 268 kilograms. He wasn't fat by any means, he was just a solid unit. Long, unruly, dark brown hair, with an almost equally long, lighter brown beard. He didn't like to wear his armor on a long flight, but it was in a closet in his quarters on his small, weary ship. Cosmetically, the ship wasn't much, but it did the job. And the job was a boring, uneventful transport run. The Thousand-Year War had been raging throughout the known, making galaxy hopping quite difficult. An unbiased side effect. Making one's return to their home world quite difficult, which over time opened up a new lucrative industry of runners. Ormin was a great runner. He made a fantastic living reuniting stranded folk to their respective planets. This run he had only 16 occupants, half of what he normally would carry. Not unusual. It's up and down all the time. Has been for the past 20 or so years, he couldn't remember exactly how long he'd been running. The old ship Vlortren, translated to Spitball, was a midsize, about the size of a school bus, freighter that had been converted into a transport vehicle, an old technique used by runners from the beginning. Even before the war, freighters were perfect for navigating the Euclidean grid, what we know as the intergalactic superhighway. Ten seconds till we split. Ormin yelled to the ship's occupants. He had a deep, growling voice, as all of his kind did. The sheer size of the Cratonian diaphragm was an evolutionary trait that was useful for commanding with one's voice. The hologram above his control board began to flash red. Ah, excellent. He began a manic laugh as the hollow display indicated there was an enemy ship giving chase blasters hot. He straightened up in his chair and slicked his hair back with both hands. Oh, he loved an exciting run. A muffled explosion was heard, and the spitball violently shuddered, sending the sixteen occupants into a frenzy of screams and sobs. Ormin grinned and yelled. It's okay, just a nudge. He increased his speed, checked the time, and made sure his shield was holding around the ship. Six seconds, folks. Shields are holding. He looked down under his console and grinned at a button that said, For a good time, call Zantar sighed with contempt and pulled a huge grin. He pushed the button. The previous owner of this ship used it for its intended purpose, which was freight. A couple of hundred years into the Thousand Year War, things started to settle. A kind of normality was slowly returning. Using the Euclidean grid was still difficult because the Utranessa patrolled a large percentage of it but freighters were allowed to carry a certain weight of goods. The previous owner came up with the brilliant idea of installing a door that would open a small quadrant of the interior of the ship that he would drop certain cargo out of to make the legal weight limit. 
a great way to make extra credits by leveraging that threat to your customers. The more you pay, the safer your cargo. Outside the spitball, a door shot open, at the rear of the ship expelling not cargo, but two pulse immersion grenades. One would have been enough, but two made for a beautiful sight. And also, Ormond didn't want anyone following them. Three. Two. One. The mountainous Ormond laughed deep and hearty as he punched the throttle. In a beautiful twisted cadence, the enemy ship slammed into the pulse immersion grenades. A stunning blue flash filled the black ripping the ship apart as fast as you could say, Trevor. It's Kratonian for screw you. Dead ahead of the spitball, a large ring-shaped device began glowing brilliantly, with their destined planet slowly materializing in the rings, once empty center. Orman flew the craft straight through the ring. A flash of light indicated the successful redeploy between galaxies connected by the device with light years being reduced to seconds. Orman could feel relief in the air from his occupants. One man even clapped. But the Kratonian took it as an insult, as in, did they think he couldn't do it? They had made it to Vinitori, the capital planet of the Kratonian Empire, and one of the safest places to be during the seemingly infinite conflict that was going on through the known universe. The Kratonians had occupied three planets in this solar system as a safe haven for anyone seeking refuge at this devastating time of war. It used to be that many, many years prior to the Thousand Year War, Kratonians were seen as savages who somehow had knowledge of advanced technology and were able to build giant starships that traversed all around the galaxy and beyond. But now, seen as saviors, helping the innocent and defenseless, as they believe that a battle should be between two equal parties. That way, it's more fun. The spitball landed at Docking Bay 417, one of hundreds of ships arriving daily, mostly made up of runners, or the occasional transfer ship that hops between the three Kratonian worlds in this system. Orman twisted around in his chair as he hit the door release. All right, welcome home. There was a hiss and a snap. Before a door on the side of the ship began to lower, barely making it to the ground, before the refugees bustled out. The lounge bar inside the terminal was quite elegant. Even in a time of war, Vinatori was seemingly untouched by the chaos and devastation of the affray that enveloped the surrounding star system. The Kratonians themselves were a warrior race, but were very in tune with the trends and tastes of the rest of the galactic neighborhood. The planet was a mega metropolis of skyscrapers, restaurants and shopping districts, gambling and drinking establishments, pleasure dens and nightclubs. Music is as common as mathematics throughout the known. There was a soft beat with pleasant synthesized chords, filling the phonic atmosphere of the terminal bar. Music loud enough to be heard just under a world of captivating conversations. Orman had sunken into an empty brown leather lounge and licked his lips with the anticipation of a deliciously refreshing sip of off-world ale. When a human man with cybernetically enhanced arms flopped next to him, he grunted at the human. Flax, do you mind? The man Flax let out a sigh of relaxation, like one has after a long day. He stretched his arms to the roof and plonked his legs onto an expensive-looking table in front of the lounge normally reserved for drinks. But today a big pair of military-style boots that were surely to leave a mark. I got a request for another run. Norman took a well-deserved sip of the ale and closed his eyes. It was liquid gold to his lips, and so cold that he could feel it traveling all the way down through his body. You met me here for this? You could have just sent through the request digitally? Flax smiled and leant over to Orman. This one came from the Emperor's office. Orman was confused. 
No runner had ever got a job from the head of the Kratonian Empire. It was not worth their time. Flax continued. There's an anomaly been detected on a very distant section of the grid. An area that's shown no activity for thousands, if not millions of years. He tried to keep his voice down, but he was too pumped up from the amount of credits the Empire was offering them for the run. Ormin still wasn't phased. And? He was waiting for a response from Flax, but he looked decidedly nonplussed. So Ormin asked another way. So what kind of anomaly? What's the Empire's interest? More so, why me? Flax sunk back into the lounge. Well, the last question is easy. You're the best runner out there. Ormin grunted and thought, no mystery there. Someone or something is accessing the grid. The readings from that area indicate that a machine is being built to allow travel between galaxies, like our rings. The great space viking's ears pricked. Hmm, ring builders, perhaps. Flax shook his head. Not likely. There hasn't been a ring built in thousands of years. Not many are smart enough for that. Orman sculled the rest of his ale and belched. What's the Emperor's interest? He wiped the froth from his beard. Empire can't handle another enemy. You need to get there and assess the situation. <laughs>